before we start on the actual presentation, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my project, which is the Conservation Communities Project. And this is um, a project that's funded by the Heritage Lottery. Um, so all of you who buy lottery tickets, I'm very grateful because you're supporting my work. Thank you very much. Um, but this project is focused on just 11 parishes, so not, very, not a very big area. And it's working with people who live in the parishes between Great Torrington and Hatherley. And within those parishes, we are working with communities to try and get them to record their wildlife sightings and not just make a note of them themselves, but to actually send those records into the Devon Biodiversity Records Centre. And the reason that this project has been set up is because there's actually very few on the ground records for these parishes. And the Records Centre would really like to have some live data of actual things that are living there, rather than just, um, uh, just guessing, really. We know this area is really diverse for wildlife, but they need some real on-the-ground data. So we're asking the communities of these parishes to help us gather that data. And it's amazing because people think they should really only record the rarities and the things that you don't see so often. But the record centre are asking if we can get people to send in quite common species. House sparrows is a great example that they always talk about. Um, but, you know, you might have all sorts of things from frogs um, and records of things that you see every day that just aren't recorded at the record centre. So if you live in any of these parishes or in fact any any parishes across Devon, the record centre here would love to hear of all of your species. So anything is great. Send it in and let us know. Um, so we're holding events so that we can um, teach people how to identify species and make people feel more confident about sending in their records. And also um, we're helping those parishes improve their biodiversity. So if people have got little projects where they can actually make the situation better for wildlife and make it more diverse, then we're going to help them if we can to do that. And in, within these processes, we're hoping that we can get the communities to um, learn lots of new skills and then share those skills with other people it, within their community. Um, I had a nice example the other day where we'd done some harvest mouse survey training um, back before um, the Christmas lockdowns. And um, after we had done that, one of the ladies went out and taught a friend of hers how to go about doing the harvest mice survey. So it's um, we're really encouraging that skill sharing. Now, obviously, at the moment, that's really difficult because people aren't really mixing so much. When this project was put together, obviously, we didn't have a pandemic on our hands. Um, and the idea was that we'd hold massive community events and lots of get togethers. So we're learning other ways about um, ways that we can go about doing this. Um, and one of the things we have done is invested in some trail cameras so people can borrow those and set them up in their garden or on some land that they might own. And using those cameras, they can then record some wildlife sightings and help build the records up like that. So we are hoping that in the summer, when we're all allowed back out again and to mix, that we're gonna hold some face-to-face -face events. But in the meantime, we're doing a whole suite of online events and there's plenty others that um, you can join in with. We've got um, a mammals one coming up in a couple of weeks and I've just organized one today about amphibians so there'll be one coming about frogs and toads and how to identify the difference between them um, a little bit about newts um, so there's plenty still to look forward to um, sometime in April we'll do one about woodland flora as well so hopefully you'll all be able to join me for some of those if you'd like to hear about events and you're not on my um, email list then do send me an email um, my email address is at the bottom of the screen now and um, I can add you to my mailing list and you'll hear about every single event that we're hosting. So I think that's about it from me. Um, I'm going to pass you over to Tom Hines who's very kindly come this evening to talk to us about Devon Hedgerows and I think we're all hoping we're going to learn um, lots of information to help us improve our habitat. So I'll pass you over to Tom. Thanks very much Tom. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go see you all. Some faces I recognise and some names I recognise, but um, good that you should all be able to get to this talk. Um, just to briefly introduce myself. Um, I used to be biodiversity officer for the North Devon Biosphere. 
Um, I retired from that and then stupidly immediately got a job um, lecturing in animal conservation at Petrock, uh, which I've done for the last couple of years. And I fully retired um, at the beginning, at the end of last, end of last summer. Um, I have a small farm in Dalton, 50 acres or thereabouts. Um, and I would always say that my main emphasis on the farm is conservation rather than agriculture. But obviously there's a good mixture of the two. And certainly my hedges, uh, something I'm very interested in and passionate about, um, are an, a very important part of the wildlife interest of the farm. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen green review and then hopefully if I can remember all the technology I should be able to get to the right place. Hopefully you can see Devon Hedges and their management and a wonderful picture of the Devon landscape showing the, the huge importance that hedges have in the county. Um, and they, there are so many reasons that Devon hedges are important. From that picture, you can see, first of all, how they all connect up with each other. Secondly, they connect up with existing habitats, particularly woodlands and grasslands. Um, and I suppose, thirdly, you'd have to say, because there are so many of them, they are just a, a fantastic resource across the whole of the county that makes them potentially one of the most important habitats um, in the county. And I think if I was to list off the three top ones, they would be cold grasslands, ancient woodlands and hedges. Um, in my prejudice manner, I would have to put hedges at the top, but I know that not everyone would agree with that. But they are a fantastic, a fantastic habitat. Um, I suppose I'll just start by defining exactly what a Devon hedge is. So if I talk to anyone about Devon hedges, I hope they always have some sort of picture in their mind of a bank, probably with shrubs on top, looking vaguely like this picture here. Um, they are unusual because most of the country doesn't have um, most of the country doesn't have a bank involved with their hedges and their hedges are all at ground level. Um, but for some reason in the past, hedges in Devon were constructed out of this earth bank at the bottom um, and at, at shrubs on the top. I don't think anyone knows exactly why. There are a number of reasons put forward. Um, none of which quite match with the, the statistics. I mean, it, obviously it helps the shrubs to be up out of some of our wetter lands, but we're by no means, Devon is by no means the wettest county anywhere. It certainly helps with um, offering extra shelter, but again, Devon isn't the most exposed county anywhere. So I don't think anyone really knows why, but obviously for a very, very long time, hedges in Devon have been built um, with a, this combination of a, a shrubs on top um, and a, an earth bank underneath. Now the outside of the bank might be stone-faced as, as this one is, um, or it might be turf-faced as the previous one was. And I would just refer to them as a turf-faced hedge and a stone-faced hedge. Um, why do some parts of the county have one and some another? Uh, this one, I think, is in, Joe, is in one of your, your um, parishes. This one is in Beeford Parish. Um, why, do, why is it stone-faced rather than turf-faced? I think there is some very good stones in that area, and what was used, what was available was used. They are probably slower to build in the first place, but they will last for longer with less maintenance in the longer term. Um, but if you're coming to repair one, it's important to match what you're, what you're working on, uh, what, what's grown around you. So as I've said, they're, they're a terribly important feature. They're not only important for wildlife, um, um, 
and I think in the past I would have said they were important for wildlife landscape and agriculture. But nowadays we look at hedges in a different way. Um, and even the government is thinking that we need to look in a broader terms at our countryside. And the way the countryside is managed, whether it be hedges or grasslands or whatever, will have an effect on these other things, such as carbon storage, flood prevention, um, and obviously the historic environment. So I always think of hedges as having a broad interest. Um, and this is perhaps one of the main emphasis of the talk, is that we shouldn't just regard a hedge as something that is a stockproof barrier for, wild, for, for farmers. It has a much broader context. I've already said they're possibly the most important habitat in Devon. Um, just to say there are thought to be 33,000 miles of hedges left in the county. And one of the reasons there's so much left um, is because it's very much a pastoral landscape. So it is very much about stock farming. Um, and it's also because agriculture in Devon hasn't progressed at the speed that it did um, in the east of the country. Um, and there many more hedges were removed in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Here, we tended to value our hedges more, and consequently, we've kept more. And we are very much a hedged county, much to the occasional chagrin of uh, visitors who come here who drive around the county saying, I can't see anything because all these hedges. Um, and obviously, the answer is, well, get out of your car. Um, just to say, if you want to follow up on any of these ideas, I'm a member of the Devon Hedge Group, who are a bunch of people with an interest in hedges, like all yourselves. And we have a very good website, which has lots of good background information if you're wanting to answer questions. Um, we have a Facebook group, which you can get on to from the Devon Hedges website. Uh, and people post all sorts of interesting things, pictures of what they're doing, questions and whatever. And we're just about to set up a forum, which will be very much about sharing information and helping answer questions. So if anyone is looking for particular bits of advice, this forum hopefully should help members um, to find those answers. So going back to this um, length of hedgerow within the county, we have something like 10% um, of the hedges in the whole of the country. So our 55,000 kilometers, 10%. But obviously we're a lot less than 10% um, of England, we as a county, Devon. Um, and consequently it shows that we are a very hedged um, part of the country. Species richness is one of the ways that we define whether a hedge is inter interesting or not. Um, the older it is, the more species of shrubs you tend to have in them. Um, and uh, we, I'm sure we've all heard of Hooper's rule, which is the number of species in a hedge relates to the number of hundred years that the hedge has been in existence. Now I've got a very nice hedge that I measured um, nine or ten different species, uh, which would suggest it's 900 or 1,000 years old. When you look on the map, it's very much a boundary between unenclosed land from the medieval time and medieval field strips, which were enclosed in the, something like the 12th century. So it does suggest that this hedge probably is as ancient as that. And I think it's important to remember that hedges um, are man-made structures that were built a long time ago and have been managed by man ever since. And I always feel that we don't regard them with as much, uh, as much regard as we should. The parish church is a man-made structure that has been looked after by man ever since it was built. These Devon hedges usually predate most of the parish churches, uh, or, or many of them do. And it's thought to be something like three quarters of them are of medieval origin. 
So it just sort of puts that into context to say that they are very ancient features that we really should regard and be proud of and look after very carefully. Of course, they were built in the first place for agriculture. Um, and controlling stock is still one of their main functions. Many a hedge, of course, has a fence next to it. So from the farmer's point of view, um, they're often seen as an expense because they cost money to cut. They take up land. Uh, they do, of course, offer shelter, um, and that's a very important feature. But I think many a farmer doesn't love them in the way that I love them. Um, and I think it's important that we try to redress that balance so that hedges become more important to the people that actually manage them. And of course, one of the reasons I regard them as very important is they're fantastic for wildlife. Um, whether it be the primroses that are growing at the bottom of hedges at the moment, or whether it be these wonderful standard trees, again, a picture in Veeford Parish, um, very much on the top of the top of the hill, so these trees are seen for miles around. Um, but whenever I drive into Winkley, as I'm sure many of you do, and you look at those beautiful beech trees as you approach the 30 mile an hour speed limit, and you think, who benefits from these beech trees? And I definitely benefit from them because I love seeing them. Wildlife definitely benefits from them um, because they're great for wildlife. But who actually picks up the cost when one falls over um, into the road or one or there's an insurance claim where something's fallen off one of these trees into the road? And of course, the person that picks up the bill is the farmer. Um, and if I was that farmer, I would be concerned about those having those trees on the main road. And that's why I say we have, an, we have an imbalance here between the value of our hedges and the people that pick up the costs of them. Um, there are no easy answers, but I introduced that early on because we will be coming back to it. And obviously one of these values are the wonderful flowers that grow at the bottom of them. And we all look forward to seeing the bluebells and campions um, and whatever that last one is that I've forgotten that I won't go through. But one of the great bits of wildlife that we have within our hedges is the dormouse. Um, I've certainly got dormice on my farm um, because I found the nest. Interestingly, Joe talking about harvest mice, I've also surveyed harvest mice on my farm and have them as well. So I'm very lucky in both respects. Dormice in Devon are doing comparatively well. In many a county, they are declining um, because of management of habitat. Within Devon, um, they are definitely they value our hedges and the good management of hedges because a hedge that flowers and set seeds will provide good dormice food for a long period. And I think one of the things with dormice is you have to remember they're often referred to as the hazel dormice. Um, but obviously if dormice only ate hazelnuts, they wouldn't be able to survive the rest of the year. And I know they spend a lot of time hibernating but they do have quite a varied diet, um, whether it be flowers, tree flowers and shrub flowers early on, or whether it be insects associated with those flowers, or whether it's nectar associated with those flowers. Um, there's plenty of habitat within a hedge that will provide good food for dormice, as well as producing nuts later on that are so important for their um, survival and hibernation. So, Devon hedges are definitely an important part of the conversation within the county. Of course, the other species, um, bats, particularly greater horseshoe bats, and all the fantastic work that Devon Wildlife Trust has been doing, researching and getting the public involved with Devon with uh, horseshoe bats, greater horseshoe bats. Um, the conclusion is that they frequently navigate along hedges and they frequently feed on insects associated with hedges. 
So there's a very close connection there between the two. Um, and obviously, Devon Wildlife Trust have been helping putting hedges back where they're missing to help uh, create horseshoe bats navigate throughout the countryside. Um, oh, yes, uh, one bit of recent research. They've been looking at what are the most valuable features on a farm to improve, the, improve its wildlife value. And one of the conclusion is hedgerow trees. And any time you have a hedgerow tree, you will attract in obviously greater diversity of habitat there, but they will attract in lots of insects and are frequently used by bats um, to locate um, places for mating um, and, very, and, and definitely a good food source for them. So I think the conclusion is that hedgerow trees on farms are an incredibly important resource and ones that need to be promoted more to farmers. Um, though obviously, as I've said, there are issues involved with them. So what, um, what condition are Devon's hedges in at the moment? That is a beautiful view of a nice bit of Devon countryside. Uh, Joe, I'm sure, will recognise that it's a Devon Wildlife Trust reserve. Tom will recognise it as well. Um, and I've forgotten which one it is or what it's called, but it's all that foreground is managed beautifully by the Wildlife Trust. But you can see we've got a variety of hedges in the background, um, some of which are cut short, some of which are allowed to grow up. Um, and there's been various surveys that have been carried out recently to look at the condition of Devon's hedges. And it's thought 38% are in favourable condition. So that means it's not full of gaps, it's not overgrown into um, a line of trees, it's a continuous cover of a mixture of species um, in some sort of sustainable management. So it's something that's going to last into the next generation. The ones that fail this favourable condition, um, quite a good percentage are because they're cut too low, too frequently, um, and don't allow wildlife to thrive in them. And equally, from the farmer's point of view, aren't kept in stockproof condition. And another big percentage are overgrown and gappy. So that's where they've been left to grow up and they're turning into a line of trees and it might be very difficult to get them back into a hedge. But we'll come back to both these issues. Um, but these are, those two issues are the big things in hedge management at the moment. Now, one of the things that the Devon Hedge Group has been promoting recently is this hedge management cycle. And if you start off on the, the green circle, you've got four stages, possibly five stages of some sort of sustainable management of a healthy hedge. So starting off at section at number four, it's just been laid or coppiced or planted. It grows up a bit to section to number five, uh, where it's one to three meters high. At sec number six, it goes to three to four meters high. Seven, it's growing taller. And then either it's laid, coppiced, so cut back to ground level and allowed to regrow, um, and brought back to number four. So you've got there a circle going round of management, long term that can be done forevermore, and the hedge will last for another thousand years, hopefully, looking exactly as it does at the moment. Um, how often you cut a hedge between number four and number five is something that again I'll be coming back to but that is good sustainable management between those numbers four and seven or eight. At the moment some of these ones that are overcut so they're cut too short um, and are consequently getting gappy would be at number one and these could get back into the sustainable management by being allowed to grow up a bit um, and coming in at a slightly taller hedge and then obviously laid, which again I'm coming back to at some stage in the future. When a hedge goes beyond eight and is going into nine, where it's seven metres plus high, it's then much more difficult to get it back into something that isn't a line of trees. 
but just going back to this um, healthy management cycle at number four, where you have a hedge that's grown up a certain amount. Tradition, I mean, for, for years, farmers in Devon have cut hedges with a flail, a tractor mounted arm um, that cuts off one, two, three years growth um, and is a very cheap and effective method of stopping hedges growing too big. They, they certainly are effective. Um, I think long term, you can't just keep on cutting a hedge forever more, that they will get gappy at the base and that will cause problems. But I am a supporter of flails because if we hadn't had the invention of the flail, we would have lost many more hedges in Devon than we did um, because flail management is an effective um, cheap option for farmers to cut their hedges. Um, there are good ways of cutting and there are poor ways of cutting. Now, one of the, the objections to cutting, and every cyclist will know this, is that, of course, you're just cutting all the uh, material off, throwing it all over the place, often onto the road, um, but not actually reaping any harvest from it. And a lot of people feel that if we could produce something from our hedges, we would be much better off, they would be much better valued. Um, and they could be seen as a positive part of our countryside that, is, um, that could be support for farmers to produce something from hedges. So farmers aren't necessarily only supported for food production, but could be supported for something environmental as well. And somebody's been doing research recently of a cross between a flail and a hoover whereby you cut your hedge and suck up all the material that's cut and use that cut material um, in a wood chip uh, burner, using it as fuel. Now, if we could develop this technique, it would be fantastic if you could cut all hedges, not just throw the cut material everywhere, but take some valuable product off it then I think attitudes towards um, hedges could possibly change in the future. Uh, it hasn't been, it's not working yet, but I look forward to the moment when I say that somebody is producing one um, uh, and will be available for, the pub, for farmers to use. Um, most farmers, as I say, cut hedges on an annual basis. And this is one that's near to me. It's a very nice blackthorn hedge that is in blackthorn flowering time. And if you can see on your screens, there are very few blackthorn flowers there because blackthorn flowers on old wood. And if you're a gardener, you will know that um, if you cut certain shrubs every year, cut their regrowth off, they don't flower because they flower on old wood. Blackthorn um, and many other hawthorn, hazel, all flower on old wood. So a regularly cut hedge won't produce many flowers. As soon as you allow it to grow up, it produces lots of flowers. So there's one of my hedges, which has been allowed to grow up a certain amount, absolutely covered in blackthorn flowers. And these are going to be a really important source of food and are obviously going to be an important source of um, slows later on in, this, in the year. But you can't just leave your hedges to grow up and then expect big ones to be cut with a flail. Um, so there is, oh, actually, we're going to just look at some of the beautiful stuff, some of these um, hips and haws, obviously hawthorn there. Just to remind me that when willows grow up, um, bumblebees find the pussy willow an incredibly important early source of pollen for trees, um, which last year was absolutely covered in bees. So there are all sorts of uh, important things when they're allowed to grow up. But mo most farmers are unwilling to let their hedges grow up because they feel they're going to get um, beyond the reach of the flail. And one of the things that the Hedge Group and many other conservationists have promoted over the years 
is just less frequent cutting. So this hedge has three years growth on it. Um, it's perfectly acceptable to cut into it with a flail, so it's quite cheap and effective. You have to cut it slower because it does a bit more damage. Um, but it is a cost-effective method of allowing the hedge to grow up a certain amount, to flower and set seed. Um, and there will be environmental benefits from less frequent cutting. Um, one of the benefits of less frequent cutting will be the brown hair streak butterfly, um, which is, uh, I'd be interested to see who's seen one. I know, Tom, I'm sure you've seen brown hair streak butterflies. But you can see from that distribution that Devon is one of their strongholds. All the orange and red dots are where they occur. The blue dots, as far as I remember, are the ones where they used to occur and they don't occur anymore. And one of the, 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 the life cycle of the brown hair streak is it, uh, it puts its eggs, lays its eggs on the, uh, the joint between two year old growth where it grows off the main stem of a blackthorn. So if you cut your blackthorn every year and you cut off two years growth, you don't have this place where they lay their eggs and consequently you don't have brown hair streak butterflies. So it's a very strong correlation between the two. Um, and people go out and survey for brown hair streaks. I have seen the eggs. Um, sadly, I've never seen them on my land, but um, I'm sure they're there. Uh, and it would be interesting, and Tom, you're an expert on brown hair streaks. I would be interested for you to clarify some more points in the, in the questions. But um, they are, you know, a very important uh, species that occur across North Devon um, and the rest of Devon and very much relate to our hedge management. Going back to flailing, it is of course unpopular. Here we have an example where it's just badly done. And the reason I'd say that's badly done is that unfortunately, most hedges grow back from where you cut into them. And this hedge, which is thin and gappy, has been cut at the top and all the regrowth is going to come back at the top. And basically it's not going to fill in any of those gaps underneath. And gaps relate to both wildlife interests and stockproofness. Um, so it's an important part, both for conservationists and farmer. Having said that, um, this is just next to the Stafford Moor Fisheries Turnoff in Dalton. So it's at the end of my road. Um, that hitch was flailed fairly hard in, I can't read what it says, March 2000 and something or other. Um, and I think many, many members of the public would have said that it was a bit of an eyesore and it was a horrible mess. But I just put this picture on to remind you that even when a hitch has been cut as hard as that, within a mere couple of months, um, it was looking as good as that. So they are very resilient to cutting. Um, yes, you may get a certain amount of uh, dieback where the open end, the cut ends are being hit by the flail, but that can encourage lower growth um, further down in the hitch so that you end up with something that's looking good and stock proof and good for wildlife. So don't panic too much if you see more he hedges being cut, what looks to be unsympathetically. Um, often it's not as bad as it looks. Um, I just put this in to remind you that, of course, there are rules and regulations about hedge cutting. We're, we've gone past beyond the time when people are allowed to cut hedges, but they are allowed, farmers are allowed still to lay hedges. Um, obviously, there are various rules and regulations by DEFRA. Um, some of the positive ones are that there are payments for managing hedges, particularly hedge laying and hedge coppicing, as well as for new planting. Um, so anyone who's interested in planting new hedges, the Hedge on Boundaries grant scheme is the one to go for. And as far as I'm aware, it will be relaunched this year. 
um, and there's all sorts of good hedge work going on across the county funded through this scheme. One of the big changes in agriculture is the environmental land management scheme, which some of you will have heard about, um, which will be starting in 2024, whereby the government is wanting public money for public goods. And this is one of the exciting changes whereby in the more distant past, farmers were paid on a headage basis. So they were paid for the number of stock they had and their subsidies came through per number of uh, animals they had. That was all seen as a poor policy whereby intensification caused lots of too many animals in the uplands, probably too many animals in the lowlands and put huge pressure on the countryside. So somebody then came across with the idea, let's have a payment per hectare. So for every hectare a farmer owns, you get subsidy on that hectare. Um, but that doesn't really help at all. And when you look at hedge conservation, all the farmer is being paid for is just having the land. If you pay public money for public goods, you can look at the broader issues of the countryside. Farmers help with clean air. They help with water retention, they look after wildlife, they protect from environmental hazards, um, and they help reduce climate change. All of those things are things that farmers aren't paid for at the moment. Um, and somebody has said this is not the right way to look after our countryside. The emphasis at the moment is on food production, we need a broader thing. So it is very exciting, and hedges do play a very important part in this. And the way hedges are managed will determine how good they are for wildlife, how good they are for carbon sequestration, um, and other things such as how good they are at reducing flood risk. And I'll be coming back to all of those at the end. Um, but perhaps just to follow on, on our hedge management cycle, as I've said, the flail is a good method of cutting hedges. But if you take a hedge like this, that's got gappy at the base, if you just cut the top off with a flail, it won't restore it in any respect and animals will still go through it. If you just keep on cutting it, it'll get thinner and thinner. And eventually the animals go through the hedge and start to bring down the bank. That is great hangman in the background, which I'm sure we all recognize. And of course, the long term consequence of this, um, eventually you end up with a line of trees, which is very difficult to bring that back into a hedge. The bank has disappeared back into the local ground, so there's no evidence. Um, there's no evidence of where the bank was. Um, and it's, it's difficult to do anything with a line of trees that looks like that. So what can you do? That's one of my hedges um, from three years ago. That I would say is definitely at stage seven in the hedge management cycle. So it's fairly tall, uh, six or seven meters tall. Um, I haven't cut it or, or done any management with it, I'm sorry to say for 30 years. My next door neighbor is fairly shocked that my hedges look in the way they do, because he says, I wouldn't want my hedges to look like yours. But obviously I say, I wouldn't want my hedges to look like yours. So we, we, we're good friends, but we just manage our hedges in different ways. So this one, um, the way to restore it is to lay it or steeping as it's referred to in Devon. So here I've cut in at the base of each of the stems to create a hinge that's thin enough to bring the steeper um, which is the stem itself, tight on top of the bank to create a stockproof barrier that will grow back, um, keep animals in, be good for wildlife, particularly my dog that you can see posing for the photo. Um, and of course, at this stage, it is a fantastic opportunity to create new hedgerow trees. So these trees will be allowed to grow on as the hedge grows back underneath. Um, and two days ago, that hedge now looks like that. So it's got two years growth on it. 
Um, it was obviously a particularly wet winter. I thought we'd had a particularly wet winter this year, but obviously that winter was very wet. Uh, how much growth has it got on? It's hard to see, but it's about uh, three, four foot from the hazels and the oak. Um, I fenced it to keep stock off, even though it was a nice stock roof barrier. I'm hoping the fence will last 25 years. I probably won't cut the hedge for the next 25 years um, and it will be, it will grow back nicely um, and will be a good source of firewood as it was the last time I cut it um, and will be wonderful for wildlife in the meantime. At the same time as laying the hedge, this is looking at the same hedge, but the other side, so they're the same trees. Um, it's important to do what's referred to as casting up. So this is taking the, the soil from the bottom of the hedge and putting it up in the middle. In the past, you would have done it with a dab and shovel, but it's very, very hard work for anyone who's done it. Nowadays, mini digger um, is a fantastic option or a bigger machine, even better. Um, and you can see I've taken out a certain amount. Because the hedge, when I uh, steeped it, is what's referred to as double combed. So looking down the middle of the hedge, I've laid the two sides separately and left a gap in the middle. With the machine, I'm halfway through the job there, I filled up this gap in the middle with the soil from the bottom. And what I've done is I've lowered the field by possibly a foot or two foot, and I've raised the height of the hedge by a foot or two foot, and consequently made a much more stockproof barrier than it was. It's also allowed this in terms of sustainable management, it's gonna stay as a big hedge for a long time to come. If you don't do casting up, the rabbits and the foxes and the stock keep on lowering the bank. And if you think what makes a Devon hedge a Devon hedge, it's this combination of the shrubs and the bank. If you don't keep on putting the soil back in, the, head, the banks get lower and lower. Now this bank is obviously very good for bluebells. So I've been trying to be sympathetic to keep my bluebells in the hedge, um, which I'm hoping they will all grow back. But I suspect it's, I, I would be interested to know, but I suspect the bluebells do very well because the stock have been in the hedge and they've browsed all the grass that was in there and kept it open. And consequently, it's a fantastic bluebell hedge. But um, I think next picture is possibly, yes. So that's the following summer. Um, looking back in the other direction, you can see how tall the hedge is that's not been laid, but you can see the filled in bit in the middle with some lovely foxgloves growing on it. Um, and that hedge is nice and stockproof, put back into a good condition um, and will stay like that for a long time to come. I just put this picture in to show how not to do it. Um, and this, I did mean to put a bill hook uh, into the picture. All these steepers have been laid, so the hinge has been created about two foot off the ground. And although you can't see it, where the sun's coming through is a gap big enough to take a, a, head, a sheep through it. So although the person who's done this hedge laying has done the right thing in doing something, that the regrowth is going to come back from where it's been cut, which is two foot off the ground. And if you think about the way that I do hedge laying, it's all at ground level, and that's where the growth comes back from. And that's the important point. Um, if you're going to do hedge laying, make sure it's at ground level. All the techniques, making it look pretty and all the rest of it, when I'm teaching people, I don't worry too much about that. But rule number one, do it at ground level. Then your regrowth will come from the right place and you'll end up with a stock group barrier. Um, different people like to do different things with their, their hedges and there are obviously competitions that people enter because they get very competitive and enjoy it enormously and I'm sure some of you watch, watching will have done hedge laying um, and would have really enjoyed it. It is the perfect moment to establish new hedgerow trees and the Devon Hedgerow, the Devon Hedge Group had a competition a while ago for new hedgerow tree establishment. And a few farmers are doing wonderful things, including one on the edge of Torrington, replacing his hedgerow trees, um, which is lovely to see it and is very unusual. Um, and they form a really important part of that bit of landscape. And the research 
suggests that the Lonely Farm over 20 hectares put in three or four new trees every year, that would keep the number of trees in Devon the same. But if you think about it, we have ash dieback um, within the county, killing off many ash trees. We're losing lots of them. And we need to somehow or other encourage farmers to possibly buy financial incentives, but certainly we need to encourage them to love their hedgerow trees, to value them, um, and to encourage them to put some back. Uh, I have no easy answers to this, but I know just how important they are across the county. And it's something we really need to do. Going back to competitions, how much can you lay in a day? Most, um, I mean, if I do 10 meters per, per day, I feel I've done well. I occasionally I do 15 meters. Uh, I'm sure some of you may or may have done more or less. This is a contractor on Exmoor who can do 40 meters per person per day. Um, the hedge was in a perfect condition. He has an interesting attitude towards hedgerow trees. Every time he lays the farmer, every time he lays the hedge, he establishes new hedgerow trees. They are rather regimented, I would have to say. I would never encourage regimented trees, but I think he's doing his bit for it. That's the way he can cope with it. Exmoor National Park are not very keen on regimented beech trees, but um, I would rather see some rather than none. Any of you, of course, from upcountry will know that hedge laying elsewhere doesn't look the same Midland style, but just to say in Devon, we tend to use crooks, which are Y-shaped or V-shaped stems, put in upside down that pull everything tight onto the bank. Elsewhere, they use um, stakes, which hold everything up. So they're rather different function and they tend to put these heatherings, which are big bits of hazel on the top. Different parts of the country, different parts of the country have different styles. Um, but hedge laying is something that I enjoy enormously. It is of course, incredibly labor intensive and not something that every farmer would want to do. There are mechanical options. Um, this is, a, rather than using a flail, you can use a circular saw. So if your hedge was overgrown and you didn't want to go in with a chainsaw and cut it down to ground level to allow it to regrow, this sort of saw will do the job quite happily. You do, of course, have to clear up the cut material, which is labour intensive, but it can be done. Foresters have been using tree shears for years. Um, the hedge managers are now thinking that this may be a good option. And this is a demonstration for farmers watching how tree shears on a mini digger will take out the bigger stems, not that it's a totally big demonstration hedge, but obviously if they were big stems, it would be better. And then you could be laying all the rest. So you could thin out your hedge with the machine and just lay the ones that are left behind. So they're definitely an option. Um, I was just gonna finish off my talk with a bit about new hedges. Um, there are plenty of options for planting new hedges. Um, and I think perhaps going back to the original thought that hedges have many functions. If you're planting a new hedge, it's important to think about what its function is. Most of them are multifunctional. Um, so I hope that everyone planting hedges will think wildlife is an important issue. And if you want your hedge to be good for wildlife, obviously these are some of the important plants that would be recommended to include. In the past, everyone would have said that hedges should be based on hawthorn and blackthorn, possibly hawthorn, blackthorn, hazel. Um, but you know, if you want a wildlife rich hedge, you have to have a broader mix of stuff. And all of those are good hedging plants which will make a good wildlife rich hedge. If you're looking at a purely a stock proof barrier or if this is an important part of it, certainly blackthorn and hawthorn and holly will be, an, will be important choices of species. Beech, wild roses, wild pear. Has anyone ever planted wild pear? It is obviously thorny. Um, I would love to see more of it planted across the county, but those are some thoughts of what you might include. If you're planting your hedges for um, 
locking up carbon. You want something that's fast growing. Um, and those are all good fast growing species. And obviously there we've tended to leave out the hawthorn and blackthorn, partly because they're slower growing, but partly because they're probably not so good. Certainly, if you're managing your hedges for firewood production, which I would say is virtually carbon neutral, then um, you want something fast growing. You don't necessarily want thorny species, but there's a good choice um, of a selection of stuff for carbon capture and wood fuel. I think, ah, uh, yes, fruit. One of the things that um, I'm keen to promote is diversity of hedgerow trees. It's certainly um, up until recently, I've tended to leave oak and ash as the favoured trees in a hedge because they're long lasting, they grow well. Um, ash doesn't produce too much shade. Ash, uh, oak is a fantastic species. But uh, many a farmer would say that hedgerow trees cause gaps in hedges. And yes, in some respects they can do, there are ways of coping with it particularly taking off lower branches. And I think the big bit of damage on that oak tree that I've done was taking off a major lower branch, um, which uh, is an important, important for letting light into the hedge itself. But why do we not do more planting of stuff that's going to produce fruit? We don't have to um, reap the benefits of that fruit. We can leave it all for wildlife if we, we want to. And I've been planting fruit trees in my hedges. They don't grow too big. Um, I'm not planning on carefully uh, managing the trees by uh, cutting them in any respect. I'm just gonna leave them to grow up. If they produce lots of small apples, I'm very happy for the red wings and field fairs to take them. If I take an occasional apple off them, I should be pleased. But basically I'm putting them in for wildlife. And if, uh, I always feel that apple trees and Devon go very much hand in hand. If we could persuade more Devon farmers to plant apple trees that they like in their hedges, I think we would have benefits for the landscape and wildlife and the cultural connection between the two. And I think this, we're just crying out for a big project to encourage more apple trees to be planted as standard trees in hedges. And they can be beneficial for carbon capture, you know, flood retention, wildlife, whatever. Um, and they, it, it's a good multiple use um, of, of those trees. I think the last thing I'm going to say, um, this is a project that uh, when I worked for the Biosphere Reserve, we carried out just above Broughton, which was looking at hedges for flood relief. Um, I'm sure many of you know that Broughton floods on an occasional basis, and lots of money has been spent on looking at hard options in Broughton itself, whereby you put in dams and concrete and spend millions of pounds trying to stop flooding. That isn't the, the only option, and I know Country Files has done lots on this. There are lots of things you can do further upstream to slow the flow of water downstream. And one of the things that we looked at a couple of years ago is putting hedges back along the contour to slow up the flow of water off land higher up the catchment. Um, and this is a big organic dairy farm who was keen to get involved with the project. I forget exactly how much, but I think sort of 250 uh, meters of new hedge were put in along the contours. They don't act as dams. So where the red arrows are, you can see there is a pipe that goes through the hedge and allows water the other side. And basically water is stored by the hedge up to a certain level and then is slowly let through those pipes so that it uh, literally slows the flow. If you put them in as a dam completely and stop all the water coming out, 
potential for the hinge coming down because it's acting as a dam and it's not strong enough to act as a dam. And then you might flood Bron Bronton below. So it's a carefully designed, uh, based on, a, I think, one in a hundred year flood that it's going to have the biggest effect on, but slowing the flow through creating new hedges. And I think that moment, um, I will just conclude by saying hedges have lots of functions um, and what we need to do to look after them into the future is to make sure that th this multiplicity of interest that they have is much valued by the farmers and the farmers are the ones who pick up the costs. And we need to support those farmers to make sure that they look after the great interests there are in our hedges um, and to make sure we support them in good management so that they're there for the future, for generations to come. Thank you very much. I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Tom, that was great. Um, we've got a few um, comments in the chat box. Um, so the nature reserve that you were um, trying to remember the name was, was Bowl House. Tom kindly put that up for us. Um, Thank you, Tom, <laughs> Bowl House more, of course, yes. Um, and if you haven't been there, it's a wonderful place um, and has some, some fantastic hedges on it. There were some great comments about your hedge hoover and um, whether we should get Dyson onto it and... Um, uh, someone did actually comment and said, "Does it? Uh, does it? Um, is there a danger that it will um, suck up all the insects as well? Um, you know, is that going to be detrimental?" Yes, um, good, good point. It, it's early days. If you're interested in looking into it, it was an article in Farmers Weekly. Um, somebody doing the research, and obviously one of the questions that come is the dead wood associated with that you cut off the hedge normally has a certain wildlife value with it. But certainly, um, and if you're picking up brown hair streak, butterfly eggs, which you might be if you're cutting over winter, could be damaging. Yes, definitely. Um, it's early days to see what might, what might work. But I, I'm, I'm always excited by somebody looking radically at how you might do some economic cutting of hedges. Obviously, my next door neighbour who thinks that I'm crazy to leave all my hedges growing up, I harvest a lot of firewood from it and I run two wood burning stoves off my hedges. So from my point of view, I see them as a valuable source of income. Um, he probably has no time in the way that I have time to enjoy my hedges because he's a big farmer. Um, and he probably has so many, so much firewood fall down, he doesn't actually need to go out and manage them. But one of the options that's been looked at is community management of hedges. So the community who want firewood say, well, I'll go out into the countryside, draw an agreement up with a landowner who has a hedge that needs managing. The community takes the firewood, the hedge is then managed, um, and it can be beneficial in both respects. And there have been good projects carried out in Devon, looking at that principle of how do you get your community involved with your hedges. But I think we need radical approaches. We need people to look at the issue and do some different things, um, whatever they might be. Um, that links quite nicely with a question from John, who says the hedges around his way are in really appalling condition, um, flailed to within an inch of their life. I think we've all seen hedges like that. Um, and he says, you know, that when they grow back, they're only sort of two foot high. Um, and he says, is your group, I'm presuming he means Devon Hedge Group, um, able to do anything to persuade the government to reward farmers for managing them um, for wildlife? De definitely, we work closely and we offer advice on every bit of government um, draft legislation to see what we can do. The Devon Hedge Group is a mixture of all the interests associated with hedges. So obviously agriculture is included, the NFU and the CLA are both represented within the group. Um, so I think the answer is yes, we try to feed back as much as we can. Um, and we always support government initiatives that do the right thing for hedges. Um, it is unfortunate that 
many a hedge is um, going back to this management cycle in the one to three stage. And as John, you're saying your local hedges are overcut, are thin, have limited wildlife value. We've got to try to persuade farmers economically, however we can, to move them away from stage one and push them into a more sustainable management four to seven. Um, we are working on it at the moment in 2024 when Elms start off, starts off, there will undoubtedly be payments for more sustainable hedge management. Um, just to go back to your brown hair streak um, comment, so um, Devon Wildlife Trust did um, an online talk and that was recorded. Um, we had the butterfly conservation come along and do a talk on the brown hair streak and how to survey it, but it was very interesting learning about the life cycle and things. So if anyone would like to see that, it is recorded. Um, so you can either drop me an email and I can send you the link or you will find it on the Saving Devon Treescapes website because that's the project that um, we combined with to do that. So Saving Devon Treescapes is a project that's based on saving the ash trees and well, not saving the ash trees, but replacing the ash trees that we're going to lose. And they're creating a, um, a, a tree nursery and collecting seeds and getting volunteers to help um, grow those on. Um, so it's quite a big county-wide project. So that might be one for people to look up if they're interested in finding out a bit more. And I, I would certainly fully recommend um, doing a brown hair streak survey. It's a winter time thing. Uh, I would very much recommend you wear glasses because you're basically going down low in a blackthorn hedge looking for something that is um, the size of a pinhead. So it's very, very small. First of all, you need glasses to see them. And secondly, you need glasses to protect yourself from all those hideous blackthorns that attack you whenever you go near them. But something well worth following up and very interesting. Yeah, there's a couple of comments on the benefits of wood, um, the sort of shelter that's created by a hedge, you know, for the cattle and livestock in the summer, especially. Um, and with climate changing and the more extreme weathers, um, then obviously that's going to be a massive help for livestock, isn't it? Especially around here. Absolutely. Uh, and um, last summer, um, the hedge group, we were all asked all, all members to look across the county to get a nice photograph of uh, cattle sheltering from the sun in the shade of a hedgerow tree and it's amazing how difficult it is to get photos like that because the light's always wrong um, but undoubtedly last summer we saw plenty of it um, if you were out and about cattle were really benefiting from hedgerow trees. Um, so Steve's asking if you can recommend a rapid growing species that may be used to fill in some gaps um, and cope with low light at the same time um, low light, I, if it's, yeah, well, I'd probably go for hazel at that one, because it'll cope with low light, it's certainly fairly fast growing, um, would be a good option. If it's underneath an oak tree that's mature, I would go for something like holly, because it'll cope with the, the big shade amounts. Um, if it's more open than that, obviously something like willow is going to be very fast growing, but won't cope with shade. Thanks, Tom. Um, so I think that's most of the comments. Um, I, if anyone's got any more questions, feel free to carry on typing. Um, I've actually got a six um, question poll that I would really love some feedback from people about tonight's talk and um, generally the sort of presentations that we give. So if I just pop that up, if people are still writing questions they can do that perhaps you could just put a yes no answer in some of my questions um, it just helps me to have some feedback um, so that I can show the funders and so that we can learn from what we're doing because obviously online talks is quite a new thing we're all people who've been brought up doing face-to-face -face presentations and holding events um, so I'm hoping that that will launch it's telling me that it's failing but I think it's up on it should appear up on your screen so there's six short questions there um, and I'll keep reading any other comments in the box and see if there's any more questions for Tom. Uh, you've got lots of thanks, Tom, coming in there. Um, and if I haven't said hello to anyone that I know, I, I do apologise, but I haven't actually, I can't see everybody. Oh, so if I move on my screen, I can see who the rest of you are, I think. Oh, yes. Right. Interesting. 
Oh, there's a nice comment from Dom who says that um, they've just moved to Devon from the city, exclamation mark, um, and building a hedge um, with Woodland Trust. Um, and uh, the extra information tonight has been very helpful. So that's, that's great. Yeah. And again, have, have a look at the Devon Hedge Group website. Um, there's all sorts of good advice on new hedges, um, which just may, may, come in, may come in useful. But I assume if you're doing it with the Woodland Trust, they'll be supplying some very nice free trees, which will be good. Oh, there was, the only thing I didn't say, one of the issues on new hedges, if you're thinking of planting a hedge, um, if it's going to go on top of a bank, bear in mind that you may at some stage want to cast up that hedge. So I've seen lots of hedges where you've got a bank and the replant that and the planting of shrubs is in the middle of the bank. If rather than putting them in the middle, you put them in what's referred to as the crown of the hedge, which is the edge of the top of the bank, you leave a gap in the middle, which you can then cast up into in the future. And that's a much easier way of doing a Devon hedge. And it's rather different from a Midland hedge elsewhere in the country, where you'd plant them in two staggered rows. You actually plant the two rows quite separately. Um, and it will, you'll ultimately end up with a much better hedge doing that. Thank you. Um, and I'm sure on behalf of everyone, I can say thanks for your time this evening. It's really, really appreciated.